Roughing It by Mark Twain, Chapter 78, Continued. She took it for the signal and promptly delivered a mellow laugh that touched off the whole audience, and the explosion that followed was the triumph of the evening. I thought that that, that honest man Sawyer would choke himself, and as for the bludgeons, they performed like pile drivers. But my poor little morsel of pathos was ruined. It was taken in good faith as an intentional joke, and the prize one of the entertainment, and I wisely let it go at that. All the papers were kind in the morning. My appetite returned. I had abundance of money. All's well that ends well. Chapter 79 Highwaymen A Predicament a huge joke. Farewell to California. At home again. Great changes. Moral. I launched out as a lecturer now with great boldness. I had the field all to myself, for public lectures were almost an unknown commodity in the Pacific market. They are not so rare now, I suppose. I took an old personal friend along to play agent for me and for two or three weeks we roamed through Nevada and California and had a very cheerful time of it. Two days before I lectured in Virginia City, two stagecoaches were robbed within two miles of the town. The daring act was committed just at dawn by six masked men who sprang up alongside the coaches, presented revolvers at the heads of the drivers and passengers, and commanded a general dismount. Everybody climbed down, and the robbers took their watches and every cent they had. Then they took gunpowder and blew up the express special boxes and got their contents. The leader of the robbers was a small, quick-spoken man, and the fame of his vigorous manner and his intrepidity was in everybody's mouth when we arrived. The night after instructing Virginia, I walked over the desolate divide and down to Gold Hill and lectured there. The lecture done, I stopped to talk with a friend and did not start back till eleven. The divide was high, unoccupied ground between the towns, a scene of twenty midnight murders and a hundred robberies. As we climbed up and stepped out on this eminence, the Gold Hill lights dropped out of sight at our backs and the night closed down, gloomy and dismal. A sharp wind swept the place, too, and chilled our perspiring bodies through. I tell you, I don't like this place at night, said Mike, the agent. Well, don't speak so loud, I said. You need not remind anybody that we are here. Just then a dim figure approached me from the direction of Virginia. A man, evidently. He came straight at me, and I stepped aside to let him pass. He stepped in the way and confronted me again. Then I saw that he had a mask on and was holding something in my face. I heard a click-click and recognized a revolver in dim outline. I pushed the barrel aside with my hand and said, Don't! He ejaculated sharply. Your watch, your money. I said, You can have them with pleasure, but take the pistol away from my face, please. It makes me shiver. No remarks. Hand out your money. Certainly, I... Put up your hands. Don't you go for a weapon. Put them up. Higher. I held them above my head. A pause. Then, are you going to hand out your money or not? I dropped my hands to my pockets and said, Certainly, I... Put up your hands. Do you want your head blown off? Higher. I put them above my head again. Another pause. Are you going to hand out your money or not? Aha! Ah, ah, again? Put up your hands. By George, you want the head shot off? You awful bad. Well, friend, I'm trying my best to please you. You tell me to give up my money, and when I reach for it, you tell me to put up my hands. If you would only... Oh, now, don't. All six of you at me. The other man will get away while... Now, please, take some of those revolvers out of my face. Do, if you please. Every time one of them clicks, my liver comes up into my throat. If you have a mother, any of you, or if any of you have ever had a mother, or a grandmother, or a 
Cheese it. Will you give up your money or have we got to? There, there, none of that. Put up your hands. Gentlemen, I know you are gentlemen by your silence. If you want to be facetious, young man, there are times and places more fitting. This is a serious business. You pick the morrow of my opinion. The funerals I have attended in my time were comedies compared to it. Now I think, curse you, curse your palaver, your money, your money, your money. Hold, put up your hands. Gentlemen, listen to reason. You see how I am situated. Now don't put those pistols so close. I smell the powder. You see how I am situated. If I had four hands so that I could hold up two and throttle him, gag him, kill him. Gentlemen, don't. Nobody's watching the other fellow. Why don't some of you... Ouch! Take it away, please. Gentlemen, you see that I've got to hold up my hands and so I can't take out my money. But if you'll be so kind as to take it out for me, it will do as much for you some. Search him, Beauregard, and stop his jaw with a bullet quick if he wa wags it again. Help, Beauregard, Stonewall. And three of them, with a the small spry leader, adjourned to Mike and fell to searching me, searching him. I was so excited with my lawless fancy tortured that my lawless fancy tortured me to ask my two men all manner of facetious questions about their rebel brother generals of the South. But considering the order they had received, it was but common prudence to keep still. While everything had been taken, when everything had been taken from me, watch, money, and a multitude of trifles of small value, I supposed I was free, and forthwith put my cold hands into my empty pockets, and began an inoffensive jig to warm my feet and stir up some latent courage. But instantly all pistols were at my head, and the order came again. Be still, put up your hands, and keep them up. They stood Mike up alongside of me with strict orders to keep his hands above his head too. And then the chief highwayman said, Beauregard, hide behind that boulder. Phil Sheridan, you hide behind that other one. Stonewall Jackson, put yourself behind that sage bush there. Keep your pistols bearing on these fellows, and if they take down their hands within ten minutes or move a single peg, let them have it. Then three disappeared in the gloom toward the several ambushes, and the other three disappeared down the road toward Virginia. It was des depressingly still and miserably cold. Now this whole thing was a practical joke, and the robbers were personal friends of ours in disguise, and twenty more lay hidden within ten feet of us during the whole operation, listening. Mike knew all this and was in the joke, but I suspected nothing of it. To me it was most uncomfortably genuine. When we had stood there in the middle of the road five minutes like a couple of idiots with our hands aloft, freezing to death by inches, Mike's interest in the joke began to wane. He said, the time's up now, ain't it? No, you keep still. Do you want to take any chances with these bloody savages? Presently, Mike said, now the time's up anyway. I'm freezing. Well, freeze. Better freeze than carry your brains home in a basket. Maybe the time is up, but how do we know? Got to wa no watch to tell by. I mean, to give them good measure, I calculate to stand here 15 minutes or die. Don't you move. So without knowing it, I was making one joker very sick of his contract. When we took our arms down at last, they were aching with cold and fatigue. And when we went sneaking off, the dread I was in that the time might not yet be up and that we would feel bullets in a moment was not sufficient to draw all my attention from the misery that racked my stiffened body. The joke of these highwaymen friends of ours was mainly a joke upon themselves, for they had waited for me on the cold hill top two full hours before I came, and there was very little fun in that. They were so chilled that it took them a couple of weeks to get warm again. Moreover, I never had a thought that they would kill me to get money when it was so perfectly easy to get without any such folly, and so they did not really frighten me bad enough to make their enjoyment worth the trouble they had taken. I was only afraid that their weapons would go off accidentally. 
Their very numbers inspired me with confidence that no blood would be intentionally spilled. They were not smart. They ought to have seen sent only one highwayman with a double-barreled shotgun if they desired to see the author of this volume climb a tree. <coughs> <coughs> However, I suppose that in the long run I got the largest share of the joke at last, in a shape not foreseen by the highwaymen, for the chilly exposure of the divide while I was in a pers perspiration gave me a cold which developed itself into a troublesome disease and kept my hands idle some three months besides costing me quite a sum in doctor's bills. Since then I play no practical jokes on people and generally lose my temper when one is played upon me. When I returned to San Francisco I projected a pleasure journey to Japan and thence westward around the world, but a desire to see home again changed my mind and I took a berth in the steamship bade good-bye to the friendliest land and livest, hardiest community on our continent, and came by the way of the Isthmus to New York, a trip that was not much of a picnic excursion, for the cholera broke out among us on the passage, and we buried two or three bodies at sea every day. I found home a dreary place after my long absence, for half the children I had known were now wearing whiskers or waterfalls, and a few of the grown people I had been acquainted with remained at their hearthstones, prosperous and happy. Some of them had wandered to other scenes, some were in jail, and the rest had been hanged. These changes touched me deeply, and I went away and joined the famous Quaker City European excursion, and carried my tears to foreign lands. Thus, after seven years of vicissitudes, ended a pleasure trip to the silver mines of Nevada, which had originally been intended to occupy only three months. However, I usually miss my calculations further than that. Moral. If the reader thinks he is done now, and that this book has no moral to it, he is in error. The moral of it is this. If you are of any account, stay at home and make your way by faithful diligence. But if you are no account, go away from home, and then you will have to work, whether you want to or not. Thus you become a blessing to your friends by ceasing to be a nuisance to them. If the people you go among suffer by the operation. Appendix A. Brief Sketch of Mormon History Mormonism is only about 40 years old, but its career has been full of stir and adventure from the beginning, and is likely to remain so to the end. Its adherents have been hunted and hounded from one end of the country to the other, and the result is that for years they have hated all Gentiles indiscriminately and with all their might. Joseph Smith, the finder of the Book of Mormon and founder of the religion, was driven from state to state with his mysterious copper plates and the miraculous stones he read their inscriptions 